is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of <laughs> Limited Resources. This is episode number 513. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources, and joining me on the line, one cool guy with a little bit of snow coming down in Denver. It's Luis Scott Vargas. You Dude, sent pictures I, it, this morning to me, Luis, of a lot of snow on the ground in Denver. It was 80 degrees yesterday. And then <laughs> this morning, it was 20 degrees, and there was like over a foot of snow. And it's going to be 70 again by the weekend. Like, what is going De- on? De- Denver's like in the middle of a weather randomizer. It's just, it's just insane. <laughs> That is very strange. Also, you know, you add music to our music when you do that, right? You realize I do put in intro music on the podcast, right? Like that's is it as that's cool as that though? Uh it's not as cool as that. Yeah, it's like, like much as pretentious better. as that. Oh, no, no, I, I, I assume it's better, but, but yeah, that but is it, much cooler music. You have it to be is real much cool cooler. <laughs> it is hard to imagine cooler music than that, to be fair. Uh, so this week on the show, we're going to uh, dive deeper into Throne of Eldraine. Lots of uh, things to talk about for the format as a whole. And we'll get in a cracker pack here and a bunch of other stuff. Before we get into it, i got to mention our sponsor. That's Channel Fireball. Dot com, the place to go to get everything you need magic related. And boy, oh boy, bit of a game changer last week happened at uh, Channel Fireball. Now, I often talk on this podcast about um, selling your cards back to CFB. And that's because we all know it. Magic's expensive. It's not a cheap hobby, right? If you want to have the best cards and keep up and get a box of every set to draft with your friends or just buy the packs you need to draft or whatever, you know, it's going to cost you. And uh, one of the best ways that you can mitigate that is by selling back any of the rares or old cards you've got or whatever to CFB. Well, the game just changed. I used to be real excited because you'd get a 30% trade-in bonus. So if you traded in your cards for store credit, you get an extra 30%. It is now 40. (laughs) It is now 40% trade-in bonus. I, When you told me this, Luis, I was like, are you serious right now? Because that is just too good of a deal to turn down. Uh, That is, um, yes, quite a big step forward for, for us normal people out here trying to grind it out. That is fantastic. Uh, Channelfireball.com slash buy list to check that out. Again, if you're trading in for store credit, you're going to get 40% bonus. So you should do that. That pile of rares has been collecting dust. You should grab it. You should go on the buy list, punch it in, send it into CFB, and turn that into a box of Throne of Aldrain or some cards for your latest commander deck, modern deck, standard deck, whatever it is that you have going on. Please do check that out. 40%, that's a lot. Uh, Patreon. That's, of course, how you can support the show directly. We want to say big thank you to everybody on the Patreon who has supported us for so long. We talked last week about the uh, 10th anniversary of the show. And, uh, of course, the show, you know, realistically wouldn't be in its current form without Patreon and uh, the people on there that support us. So thank you so much for that. Uh, we really appreciate it. And one of the little things we like to do is uh, take the cards that we get in the crack of packs and we give them to a patron. And uh, this one is going to go to Eric Copeland. Eric, thank you so much for your long support of the show. We really appreciate it. And you're going to get some nice stuff here. Luis, this one has, this is the one with uh, Vivian, the Foil Knight of the Ebon Legion. There's a temple in here, a Narset. Oh, and the Questing Beast as well. So, ooh. Yeah, that, that 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 one that one has good has got the goods. Mm-hmm. You can, you could probably get a lot of store credit if you traded all those cards to Channel Fireball. Yeah, what I should have done <laughs> is seen how much that's actually worth in store credit, because that is certainly one way to do it. Hey, it wouldn't hurt my feelings if uh, if Eric said, you know what, I'd like to have some more uh, booster packs or something along those lines, and did that anyway. Eric and to everybody else on the Patreon, thank you so much. And uh, let's do a cracker pack here, Luis. This one will um, seed the next round, if you will. Is this one of those collector boosters? No, I do have one though, and we might open it on the show. Actually, I was going to look oh, okay. into it and make sure that it's actually like the thing is, I don't want to open it if it's a um, if it's not an actual pack in there, right? Like, it does it have multiple rares? Like, I don't want to ruin crack a pack for it, but I would, you know, it'd be kind of fun to open one. I ended up with two of them, so we should just know. open one. It would be great. Okay, you know, maybe we'll just do it. Maybe we'll do it today even. I can just go grab one. Let, let's look at this pack first, though. Yeah, First good. one is Festive Funeral. This is four and a black for an instant. A common target creature gets minus X, minus X until end of turn where X is the number of cards in your graveyard. Um, I would call oh, this yeah. card disappointing, but I never really had high hopes for it in right. the first uh, place. This card answered the question of how bad 
does removal have to be before we stop playing it? And festive funeral is just not where you want to be. Right. It's just too often that it ends up stranded in your hand and doesn't do anything. When you read it, you think, yeah, this will be fine. But uh, yeah, it just doesn't end up getting there. Now, when when we are talking about five mana removal, there is a bar that is absolutely playable. And Syrian Barrage, in fact, exceeds it. This is four and a red for an instant. It does five damage to a creature. And if you adamant it with red, it does three damage to that creature's controller as well. This card's good. Which I'll play that you card You basically all day. always do. Yeah. Yes. Like and you I, adamant I, it a I, lot. I don't think I've gotten hit by this card without getting taking an additional three. Like it just right. doesn't really happen. Yeah, it's interesting because when you think about it, when it comes to adamant, if you're a two color deck and you have uh, five lands on the battlefield, you you have adamant in one of your colors, <laughs> right? Like it, you don't know which one, it, but if you're leaning harder towards red, it's quite likely you'll be you'll be all set up. Uh, next is Merrily Frighter. That's the one in a green three one. You can sack a food to make something block it. It's, it's fine. a fine card. Yeah, it's a two drop that you can play. Barrow Witches, four and a black, three, four. When the ETBs return target knight card from your graveyard to your hand. I have uh, not been really doing this. I, to me, this card reads as quite strong. It's got decent stats and it's card advantage if you have enough knights floating around. But I, I just never end up doing this. Um, I've, yeah. liked it in, I've liked it in black, green, grindy decks because you often just have a couple knights. Plus, Merrily Friders a knight. And, mm, okay. you know, and, uh, so, you know, you, you have a couple different options, uh, there, and it's just kind of a, a card advantage mechanism. If, mm -hmm. If not the best card, I would definitely not prioritize it, but I don't mind playing it. Uh, you know, if you end up there, like Garen Brig Paladin, also a knight, the, the adamant green, you know, five, and five, five. So mm -hmm. if you're running low on <laughs> late game power, which we'll, we'll certainly talk about, uh, this is a kind of card that is solid there, but again, I'm not excited by it. No, certainly a playable. Um, Wishful Merfolk. I wish that I'd never opened this card. Generally speaking, it's one in a blue for a 3-2 with Defender. You can pay one in a blue to have it lose Defender until on a turn. Cool flavor. Not a card I'm actually interested in playing very often. Um, Beloved Princess. White for a 1-1 one, one lifelinker. Can't be blocked <laughs> by creatures of power 3 or greater. I, I, this is another kind of like I get the flavor, but the card's just stone. I, I, I almost lost to this card. Uh, they, they, put all the glitters, they put all the glitters on it, made it a 6-6. Six, six, oh, 6-6 six, six life? Like, that's sweet. Yeah. But then I baked it into a pie, and it was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And you got the, uh, the, the aura frosting on there, too, to get a little extra yeah. value. That's pretty brutal. Which is Cottage is next. This is the Swamp that enters the battlefield tapped unless you control three or more other swamps. And if you do, uh, and it enters the battlefield untapped, you can um, uh, you can put a creature from your graveyard on top of your library. Fine. But I still like yeah, Syrian nothing Barrage. nothing special. I, I, I'm still pretty low on uh, all those lands, by the way. Oh, yeah. I have, I, I have found, I found them just to not be good. I think that... Uh, Gingerbread Cabin has applications because you can if in a deck that makes the food token like a significant piece of your puzzle. But uh, for the most part, besides like Mystic Sanctuary, I really haven't liked it very okay. much. Mystic Sanctuary is solid though. Because mm -hmm, the game goes really, really long. Um, the game goes long and hit, they're milling you a lot of the time or you're milling yourself in some particular mm -hmm. cases. And, and if you have a – you know, if you have a, a really good spell to get back, it can obviously go up in value quite a bit. I'm, I'm but, a little higher on these than you are. I mean, what's the big downside here? <clears throat> it comes to play tapped, and there's a lot of good five drops. Basically, I don't – in a two-color deck like that's like nine, eight mana base, mm -hmm. I tend not to play these. Yeah, see, for me, I look at it like this. If I have it in my opening hand or in the first draw step, then it comes into play tapped on turn one. I don't care, right? That, that's really yeah, not that a downside, right? And then if it's later in the game – um, it doesn't matter. Like if it goes long, if it's my seventh land or something, it's like, I actually want it there. Uh, the times when it stinks are when you like draw it when it needs to be your fourth land or, you know, and, and you don't have the, the adamant thing going on or whatever. But that's a somewhat narrow case. And I'm, I guess I'm not, I don't view that as like such a huge downside. I, I just, I just look at the upsides and think that they're not, not, they're generally not worth it. Like Dwarven Mine is just not a very. Don't, I don't like that card, one. You know? Yeah. The red and the white one, I, I don't play because, well, I don't play red and white together. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, but also because, um, yeah, curving is, is so much more important. But blue and black, uh, I'm into. And the green one, I think, is the strongest just because a food token is actually like a very real thing. The, the green and blue ones, I think, are the ones that have the highest upside. So mm -hmm. they're the ones I'm most likely to play. Mm -hmm. So it's mostly the Mardu ones that I don't really. Okay. Uh, next is Lockthwain Gargoyle. This is the one drop. It's an O3. You can pay four mana to give it plus two, plus zero, and flying. Terrible. Not good. Just junk. Uh, 
Two unveiled tree folk, five and a green for a six five, but it's got oaken boon sorcery adventure. It puts two plus one plus one counters on target creature. It's playable. You can run this card. Yeah, yeah. it's a fun. Be card. careful though, for I mean, the love of all things. Don't don't get blown out. Yeah, I mean, I was going to mention it later. Might as well do it now. Like, I still see so many people just losing their adventure cards because they are targeting something that is not there when the adventure is. Yes. Oh. If you try to put the counters on something and it gets bounced or killed, you're not going to get the counters or the tree folk. Right. And there's a number of cards that this comes up with. So just really, really try not to – like you're playing against you know so, like black and they have a bunch of open mana. You attack and use your combat trick that's an adventure. It's just not going to work out well for you so much of the time. Yeah, I've seen that all the time. Uh, maybe I've also bumped up my evaluation of counter spells a little bit more too. Because I'm always tempted to use a counter. Yeah, that answers both halves. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Mr. Misford River Turtle. Three and a uh, blue for a one five. Whenever it attacks, you can have attacking non human creature. Uh, I had exactly card. one deck where this card was good, but <laughs> what, what was <laughs> for it the in? Most part, it's not. I had a blue green deck that had multiple of the the blue green hybrid turtles, the the four mana four fours mm, mm-hmm. plus like plus some some real bangers and and just having the mist for a river turtle. It mostly was just like one shot deal an extra five damage, mm. but sometimes you get multiple attacks with it. It, it. it can be powerful when it's actually carrying something on its back. It's just kind of hard for that situation to come up. The, the one time I've ever tried to make its ability work, I attacked with a human. <laughs> and my yeah. opponent just took it. I, I don't know if like it was just a fine attack anyway or whatever, but I thought it was free. I'm like, oh, I'll just get in with this. It's like four power or whatever. And I'm like, oh, right. I've totally forgot. It's just non-human. I mean, I, I had a situation where my opponent didn't attack into my turn two order of midnight, the 2-2 flying camp block. Mm. So then on... On turn three, I just chose not to attack with it because I'm like, well, I don't want to race here. And <laughs> keep, it worked last keep turn. Keep the illusion alive. Did it? Did it? Uh, yeah. Did they attack? No, they figured it out and attacked. No, me. <laughs> what a bad so, beat. <laughs> I, I think it was worth it. Still not attacking there, but it was pretty <laughs> That's funny. That's great. Uh, all right, uncommons. First one is glass casket. This is the one in a white artifact. When it enters a battlefield, you exile target creature and opponent co- controls with converted mana costs three or less until gas- glass casket leaves the battlefield. Well, this would this be the good. best card. Yeah, it's just I don't want to play white at all. Uh, Planes really just are not having a good run, Dude. Here, but uh, we'll talk about yeah, that. Yeah, we're going to talk about that on the show this week because we, we have before and it's like more well, bad Well, we are technically news. on the show this week already. True, true. So we could talk about true. it. True, we could talk about it later. But that's that's for that's for patrons of a certain level only. <laughs> we don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't do that that people know about. Yeah. <laughs> it's the, 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 the secret tears for <laughs> Oh my god. Uh I kinda like this. Right, is I, this guerrilla marketing in action? Like are you <laughs> Yeah. I will explicitly say there are no secret tears because I think some people might actually How would you know? think that was the case. Oh geez, yeah. Well <laughs> this, this goes even deeper than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, I, I, I guess let's just move yeah, on. Yeah, the glass casket tier though is uh, is currently open to all. It's really tough because it's a better card than Searing Barrage, but I I'm not taking glass casket. I'm just not. I don't want to be in white at all. Uh, next is Inquisitive Puppet, easily the creepiest card in the set. It's uh, one for an O2. You can sack it to scry one, or excuse me, when ETBs you scry one, you can uh, exile it to create a one one human token. Another unplayable. Uh, this card is Once in Future. So this is a three and a green for an instant at Uncommon. Return target card from your graveyard to your hand. Put another one, put up to one other one on top of your library, and then you exile Once in Future. But if you adamant it for green, you just get both cards into your hand. And by the time you cast Once in Future, that's always the case. I, I've never seen this yeah. not get both. So this certainly yeah. went up in our in our evaluation mm-hmm, for sure. In a in a grindier format, just find back your two best things out of your graveyard. And when people are milling you and stuff, heck yeah. I, I am in for once in future. In fact, I would take it here. Uh, over, that would be my pick right now. Yeah. yeah. The, the fact that people are milling you does make this card really strong. Like, you know, some people enjoy this sort of thing. I think we're, we're higher on the list, but like this is the kind of format where you see once in future in your opening hand and you just know, I got to save this. I got to cast this on like turn 10 and I'm going to get back the two exact two cards I need to win the game. Yeah. I mean, you said it happens to align with our preferences, but don't don't get it twisted. This is a format where that's a very, very real thing. This is not us saying we prefer this, but we're just going to willfully ignore, you know, some aggressive deck that's really good or the format happens to be hostile to stuff like this. That is not the case. Like 
Once in future is a game plan. And there's many cards like that, that when you have them in your opener or when your opponent plays them early, completely change the way the game is going to play out long term. And there's not a lot of ways to interact either. Our rare is Fay of Wishes. This is the one in a blue one four flyer that has you can pay one in a blue and discard two cards to return it to its owner's hand. And then it's got Granted, which is three in a blue for a sorcery. You may choose a non creature card you own from outside the game, reveal it and put it into your hand. I like Fay of Wishes a lot. Same, uh, same. In, in formats like, well, like any modern format, you're going to end up with more playables than you need. So, it's not hard to have a couple high leverage cards in your sideboard for for to wish for with granted. Yeah. So what are the types of things that you – you know, how far would you go, right? Are we just talking about making sure you pick well, up a couple of sideboard cards for sure? That's part of it. Uh, part of it too is – I would not uh I would not put like a bacon to a pie in my sideboard. That card is just too good, right? Right. But Festive Funeral is actually kind of the perfect card. Cause mm, mm-hmm. you know that when you if you have the time to go wish for it and cast it, it's gonna be a removal spell. But you're not you're not really gonna want to main deck it. It's not that good of a card. Also, uh narrow cards are pretty good. So like really narrow, expensive cards uh are, are the sort of thing that you really want in your sideboard here. And yeah, so it also is just, you know, a two for one because you're paying four mana to get a card and then you get to play this as a fairy. And then you can also even later cycle lands back into spells. Also, Unexplained Vision is a good card to get if you have like multiples because it's not like you really want three in your deck anyway. Mm-hmm. So, but the time when you want so, it late, you really want it. Yeah. Right. So when you have extra copies of a card that's expensive, having stashing some in the sideboard, you know, into the story is a perfect card to put in your sideboard to go wish for. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, or a counter spell like didn't say please if you don't if you have enough that you're not main decking all of them. So it's not hard to have two to three good targets in your sideboard. And it's also a two mana one four flyer, which can then come back later to to start doing this wishing nonsense. Yeah. So I think Fave Wishes is quite powerful and I'd be happy taking it. I would too. I'd take Fave Wishes. It's also in the color that I want to be in. Blue is great in this format. Okay, I'm gonna go grab oh, one of those packs and we're gonna open it right here. You you entertain the, the listeners while I'm gone. I entertain the listeners? All right. Well, uh, I can uh, here, here. I'll give you a sneak peek. Uh, if there were a constructed resources, which I think they're just working on the next episode, it hasn't it hasn't quite come back yet. Uh, did you? Did one you? Of the did things you tell I would a talk story? about. What did you do? Oh, that was fast. I was just getting going. <laughs> Go ahead. Fire it off. All right. Well, what I was saying was, uh, even though constructed resources on a short hiatus, uh, <laughs> I was, if if I were invited to be on constructed resources, one of the things I would speculate about is what would what's going to get banned in standard. Because Wizard of the Coast just announced there is going to be an additional ban restricted day in two weeks, and they even said no changes will be made to Eternal formats, or at least not to Vintage, because Eternal Weekend's like the next week. Mm -hmm. It heavily implies they're going to ban a card in Standard, and given the current state of Standard, I've been testing for the Mythic Championship that is is sorely needed. My prediction is Field Field of the Dead and nothing else gets banned, but... Honestly, I know Oko's in the latest set. I know it's an Eldraine. I, I'm really concerned that if Field gets banned, Oko's gonna gonna run rampant here. And uh, I wouldn't hate Field plus Oko getting the boot, but I, th- I think Field of the Dead is going to get banned in two weeks. So Oof. that's our uh, br- brief interlude there. Okay, so I've got what is this thing? It's a collector booster. Yeah, I opened a couple of these at TwitchCon. I was lucky enough to get my hands on them. It's basically like a premium booster. It's got a lot of really cool looking cards in it. I opened a foil uh adventure alternate art murders rider for example whoa uh, you can a full art emery like these are like the kind of cards that are in there now, so now how should i do this then we'll just do a cracker pack but you have to describe the card but should we to, just put them talk- all into the into the cracker pack oh, giveaway yeah. whoever, or should it be its whoever own wins, nah whoever wins the next cracker pack giveaway just gets to, to collect all the loot okay cool all right now but you said that there might be an additional rare in here or something i i'm not even, i'm not 100 percent sure okay. how many rares are in all there right, well we'll but, look through Wow, this feels heavier than than normal. It's all the foiling. Yeah. All right. First card is Foil Henge Walker. That's a three mana two two. But if you add a minted, it gets a plus one plus one counter. It's a fine card. All right. Uh, next is Foil Rose Thorn Acolyte. This is two and a green for a two three that taps to add a mana of any color, and you can play Seasonal Ritual, which is green sorcery adventure, add one mana of any color. Good card. Uh, fairy yeah. guide mother that's the white one one flyer and it's got gift of the fey one and a white sorcery turkey which gets plus one plus two plus one and flying until end of turn nothing great so far 
Uh, they're all foils, so this is sweet. Uh, <laughs> foreboding fruit is two and a black for a sorcery. A common target player draws two cards and lose two life. If you adamant it, you get a food. Fine. All right. That's not bad. Yeah. Speaking of card draw, here's unexplained vision. This is the four and a blue sorcery. Draw three cards, adamant it for blue, and you can scry three after that. Card's been very strong. Yeah. I think I'm on an unexplained vision right now. Yeah. Same. Embrith Paladin. Oh, I'm so sorry, buddy. Three and a red for a 4-1 Haster. <laughs> it's Human Knight. Adamant. It gets a plus one, plus one counter. No. Skull Knocker Ogre. You know, I wish that this format was a little more balanced just so I could figure out if this is like still an interesting card. Three and a red for a 4-3 Ogre at Uncommon. Whenever it deals damage to an opponent, if that uh, that player discards a card at random, if that player does, they draw a card. Yeah, I'm not in love with this one. Me neither. But your your uh, your insight on this one was really interesting during the set review when you were talking about how it changes at different stages, like when it hits you actually yeah, matters. I think, yeah, I think it's an interesting card. I would love. I would kind of love if this was just a four four, so we would get to see that in action. Mm, you know? mm-hmm. Instead, it trades off for Mary Leaf Rider too much. Uh, all right, so now we've got uncommons. Uh, Deathless Knight is our first one. This is another four. These are all foil, by the way. It's a, this is the green black hybrid four drop. So it's a skeleton knight. It's a four, two haster. And whenever you gain life the first time each turn, you return it from your graveyard to your hand. I, I got a chance to actually play this. Um, actually, it was for a video for CFB. Um, it's pretty good. Uh, it's just you need to be in green black and you need to be able to trigger it every once in a while. Yeah, which isn't it, the first part's the hardest one. Mm-hmm. It's not hard to trigger it. If you are in green black, you will have without even trying like two to three food manufacturers. And if you are trying more than that, so it's, it's a pretty sweet card. Yeah, it's okay. Um, our first uncommon is overwhelmed apprentice. So this is the blue, uh, uncommon. It's a one, two. What's that? Over eager apprentice or overwhelmed? Uh, Overwhelmed. Yeah. Overwhelmed. Yeah. It's a blue for a one, two. When it ETBs, you mill your opponent for two and you scry two. All right. Uh, so, I mean, it's it's a, it's not a great card. I think it's playable, though. I agree. Uh, and then, yeah, see, this is where I get a little confused. So now we've got a rare, although nice. this is cool. This is like a full art adventure card. Thing. Huh? Yeah, adventure, exactly. It's Fae of Wishes. Hey! <laughs> so another I think the one adventure, of those. The adventure ones look really cool. They really do look cool. Um, so this is not a full pack, though, because... Oh, no, that is. Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six. No, that's only 10 cards. But we have seen uncommons, commons, and a rare now. So let's just keep going. I don't know what, how this works. The next is another uncommon. It's Embrith Shieldbreaker. This is a one in a red for a human knight. It's a 2-1, but it has battle display as its adventure. Destroy target artifact. Dude, the artwork on this is absurd. Yeah, I, the alternate art ones are just so cool. What in the, I mean, the, this looks like old school magic art, like, they did something yeah. crazy. Also, on the alternate art crazy ones, they don't ha- they don't bother explaining what any of the cards do. So there's none of that reminder text, which is awesome. It just oh makes it yeah, look a lot cool. it's just a little cleaner. Yeah, uh, we got another common. That's a wow. Geez, the art is insane. This is Merfolk Secret Keeper. This is a card we're going like to be talking one. about quite a bit here. Yeah, blue O four, but it's got Venture Deeper, a sorcery for blue that mills your opponent or moves, mills a player for four cards. Yeah, okay, this is confusing. <laughs> There's a command tower in here. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this might not be a pack you open during a draft, though I would no. still take Fae of Wishes in this particular case. <laughs> yeah, I would as well. Uh, there's more. Uh, <laughs> we've actually got two rares. Uh, we've got a Sorceress Spyglass, which we're not going to take, but it is full art, so somebody's going to be happy to have that. Uh, and then we've got a full art foil. God, this is gorgeous. It's Castle Lockthwain. This oh, is the Black Castle. Black Castle. Yeah. So it enters a battlefield tapped unless you control a swamp. It taps to add black mana and you can pay one block black, tap it to draw a card and then lose life equal to the number of cards in your hand. That card's sweet. Yeah, I think it's solid. I have, I mean, I've had games where it is it is good even though it's, it's a, not a very high impact card, right? Like you take it because it's additional value, but most of the time you're going to not even activate it once. In the game. Yeah, it's it's really only good if you get down to zero or one cards in hand and start activating it because it just kills you too quickly. And by the way, there's also a foil token here. It's a food. And yes, it is the twisty banana food, by the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that was fun. So I'll put that in the uh, in the next one. 
and then somebody will get that. So that's just a whole awesome thing. So I, I don't know how to differentiate what was the real pack there. I, I think Fay of Wishes uh, was the delineator there, but yeah. Yeah, and then there's like do. bonus stuff after that. Yeah, I think right, so. Well, but yeah, anyway. Uh, so why don't we move on, though, to our main topic here, um, which is diving deeper into Throne of Eldraine. So I thought that we could start things off um, by doing some sort of uh, sketched out power rankings here uh, for each of the colors for their commons. And then uh, we can use that as discussion point because I kind of threw it together. So if you have any uh, changes you'd make or anything you want to add, then you can. And we and it will hopefully give kind of an idea for where we're at in the format in general. And then uh, some other talking points after that. So we'll start with white for the power rankings. I have uh, the first white common as Ardenvale Tactician. That's the two, three flyer, but it, it, you can do the one and a white to tap two creatures at instant speed as well. And I got to say, man, this is this is where I want white to go, right? These are the type of cards that I want to see out of white. Good aggressive cards that aren't dead if you talk to, top deck them late. I had a chat with Ryan about that on the show, and this seems to be the exact direction that could bring white uh, back, or maybe not even back. I don't even know if it was ever super good, but at least give it more of a strong aggressive identity that doesn't just completely fizzle out in the late game. Um I also, and then I had trapped in a tower, white's best removal spell, and then flutter fox and youthful knight. And then I was just like, I don't even know what else. Like I looked at the rest and I'm like, I don't want to play any of these. Yes. Beyond, besides those cards, the white falls off pretty quickly. I think fairy guide mother's fine. You know, okay. it, it, I think, I think it does what the white decks want to do, but for the most part, yeah, white does not have a whole lot of banner commons and be- besides maybe trapped in the tower, they're all pretty heavily aimed towards aggressive decks. Mm hmm. Ugh, it's a bad place where white is. We'll we'll talk about uh, more about that in a few minutes here. Uh, then that's on blue, and uh, to me, you know, the top two are so tiny and charm sleep. Um, the the one that you pick sort of depends on what you already have, though. That that's kind of the interesting part is like if you already have a charm sleep, then the first so tiny probably jumps it. If you don't have either, then charm sleep is a is a better sort of catch all removal spell. Um, but I got to tell you, Luis, I'm really high on So Tiny. I think that card is fantastic. They're both really close. So Tiny is just is is very good. It's better than I think it looks to a lot of people. It is it is essentially premium removal. Mm-hmm. So if you think about it that way, you're not going to be too far off. We, we were talking about this, and I think that the first of these two you want is a Charm Sleep. But then mm-hmm. if you're offered the choice, you want a So Tiny over the second Charm Sleep. I'd rather have one and one. On the third, I would take another Charm Sleep, but then from there on out, I'll probably just take So Tiny. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I have played a lot of. So, I've played like five in a deck and been totally fine <clears throat> on yeah, So Tiny, be- especially if that deck is not focused on attacking and specifically focused on milling. It just all of a sudden becomes actual Swords to Plowshares, despite what I uh, seem to like claiming. <laughs> since your yeah, deprivation you, was you actually got there. <laughs> it's yeah, like it's it's hard. really that good. It also scales with the game. As the game goes longer, it gets better, eventually bumping up to minus six, minus zero at some point. And again, if you're trying to mill your opponent out, and boy, the, the mill deck is very real. We'll talk about that too. Um, that's a thing. And as evidenced by that, I have well, number two I mean, or three, if you want, at, at as Merfolk Secret Keeper. Yeah, the, the the fact that this is a combination of a spell and an 04 can mill them or you both. I mean, at this point, we're milling them a lot more often. But you can also mm-hmm. mill yourself if, if, if it comes to that. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically the reasons you would do that is if you had forever young Emery, uh, potentially the, the, the cauldron dance or whatever to raise dead, uh, for, for five mana or the, the zombify for five mana. But for the most part, you're just, you're just going to be milling your opponent here. Uh, your mm-hmm. cauldron's gift is the thing. Uh, but the reason this is so effective is because it's a creature as well. First of all, it just blocks. So, <laughs> you know, you're, when you draw, when you when you drafted your deck full of one mana mill fives, tome scours, you would run into the problem of your opponent just killing you because you're casting these. Well, Merfolk Secret Keeper does double duty. When you get to mill them on turn one, play it on turn two, and they have a youthful knight in play, you blanked their youthful knight and got your mill plan kind of going. Yes. The other thing is, it's easy to bounce Merfolk Secret Keeper with cards like Run Away Together to get it back with you know cards like Forever Young. I, I've had a deck with three Merfolk Secret Keepers that can mill five or six times a game because it's got ways to get them back. Then all of a sudden you look over at all your opponent's creatures and they have a bunch of So Tinies and Charm Sleeps on them. And you've got two Merfolk Secret Keepers that are on the battlefield holding back a couple of small creatures. And you're just like, 
what are you going to do? And, uh, yep. and of course the card draw in blue is excellent as well with, uh, witching well and unexplained vision, which I have at four and five. I actually have, didn't say please above those, which yeah. I don't know, uh, you know, if people agree with that, but the truth of the matter is I want about as many didn't say pleases as I can get. Uh, I just do not fear being ran over. If I can get two, two or three so tinies, I'm just not worried. You know, the, the big, big, big downside to didn't say please in that type of card is if they go two drop, three drop and they're on the play and now you're taking four or five a turn, you're like, ah, oh, man, I, I'm stuck with these stupid counter spells in my hand, but I needed them for my opponent's early plays. If I have Merfolk Secret Keeper in so tiny, I am never losing to your two drop and your three drop ever. I'm just not losing to those cards. And so now what do I care about? I care about your more expensive cards and I care about my win condition, which is milling you. And any time I can get incidental win condition on cards that I could play anyway, I'm really happy about it. I'm I'm quite stoked to completely brick wall one of your cards while also adding to my win con. So that's why I have it above those two, because the truth of it is, is that Witching Well and Unexplained Vision, that those are two premium card draw car, cards at common, in my opinion, and you can get them. I mean, th- there's two of them at common. You can find them. You're, you're going to get what you need on that. You don't, you don't need five of those, but I'll play as many didn't say please. So that's why I have it ranked a little higher. Yeah, I, I, I like that. And I, I think that didn't say please does a really good job of answering the cards you care about, which in mm-hmm. formats like this tends to be not very many cards in the opposing deck. Right? Mm-hmm. You're, right. you're playing this blue-black mill deck against a black-green deck, and you're like, well, I've got to answer Sir Conrad and Forever Young. But other than that, I don't care too much about their stuff. Yes, yes. So I want to have a couple of these in order to do that. And it, it also pairs really nicely with Bounce. Because if you've got some good Bounce spells, then you can make sure that even if you're taking a card advantage hit, bouncing their thing and then countering it on the way back down is critical. Yes, that's absolutely the case. And, you know, there's the the uncommon turn into a pumpkin and then the uh, – what is it called? The one in a blue Bounce both? Yeah, run away together. Run away together. Yeah. So, you know, you've got, you've got both of those options to try to get something out of the way. Cause, uh, furthering your point about it countering the things that you really care about, you know, if you're playing blue, black or blue, red, for example, like enchantments can be a problem, right? Artifacts, you can't kill them in many cases. Uh, and so you do need to have those. And like you said, forever young is the card you're the most worried about somehow. And that is something that you're going to need answers for as well. And you're, you know, doesn't matter how many, card draw spells you have um you need to have you need to have some answers for those and blues form of answers for problematic cards that you can't deal with once resolved or counter spells so you can have counters um black so the, well just one second mm. looking at these mm-hmm. top you know five six mm. cards here uh when it comes to blue mm-hmm. it's pretty clear what blue is trying to do at least what yeah. we like to it to do right now which is you cast, you know, so tinies and charm sleeps and didn't say pleases to stop yourself from dying and then mill your opponent out with secret keeper or just draw enough cards with unexplained visions and witching wells. It doesn't always have to be mill. Sometimes you're beating them with like, you know, uh, you know, fear the reaper and reaper, uh, the reaper of night, they're just huge four mm-hmm. fives or, yep. or whatever. Like it, once you've controlled the board uh, enough, you can win with kind of whatever you please. And it's really telling that these are the cards that, uh, really, stand out the most for blue. I did want to mention one other blue deck, which d- does come up, which is the kind of Vantress Paladin mono blue aggro deck. And this is c- kind of more like traditional blue white flyers, mm. where if you get enough uh, Vantress Paladins and enough islands, this is the adamant three and a blue two, two flyer, but adamant plus one plus one, you can, uh, you can end up tempoing your opponent out. Arcanist Owl is excellent in this deck. And, yep. and you can end up often just, Killing your opponent fairly easily in the air and just delaying them with still the same cards. So Tiny and Charm Sleep still do do good work in this deck. But mm-hmm. Blue isn't monotone uh, control mill. It just has it has the option to be an aggro deck as well, which it's kind of funny. It's like it does the best controlling thing, but still has the aggro option. Whereas like, you know, White has the aggro option, but doesn't really have that much of a control option, except when paired with like Blue or Black when you're just splashing a couple of white cards. Right. Just a few of their, uh, but you know, the trapped in a towers or whatever. Yeah. Blue, blue, uh, is, is definitely a crusher in the format. Now black has a, a strong claim for best color in the format because of the removal that you get. The number one and number two are just, you know, two of the top three or four commons in the whole set bake into a pie and Reeve soul. Uh, for my money, bake into a pie is the best common in the set, uh, full stop. And then Reeve souls right up there as well. 
Um, I mean, black gets the best removal pretty often, and here they absolutely do. I mean, those two cards are just awesome. They solve your early problems with Reeve Soul, uh, <laughs> and then bake, bake anything that you need to kill later into a pot. So, so you know, we're, now's a good a time as any. Uh, you know, I, I I was a big fan of M20 on Arena. I am mm-hmm. not a big fan of uh, Eldrin on Arena. I, I just have to say it. Like, the Reaper of uh, Reeve Soul kind of reminds me because. You, how many p- times have someone's tweeted a screenshot at us with seven Reeve Souls or five Reeve Souls yeah. or whatever? Like, what is going on with it? I've been playing almost all on Magic Online, so same. I think I've got three drafts in on Arena, and I was like, yeah, I think I'm okay. It also just kept crashing, and I was trying to do well, videos and stuff, and I'm like, I don't, I don't want to deal with that. That's a separate issue, but a very mm-hmm. real one. I can't play Arena on my uh, on my MacBook anymore. <laughs> it, it doesn't just crash. It just doesn't work, yeah. Like, because I, I have to use parallels. Uh, you know, you have yeah, to use like, I'm parallels using that or, on or mine. Yeah, something. I'm not having but, an issue like loading it or anything, but it just. Um, well, I can play it, but dies. every third game it just crashes. So, yeah. um, but anyway, go, going back to the arena bots, like I think a big part of it is like some of the cards that are pointed low, and it's not. It's sort of not dynamic, like, or at least it doesn't seem to be because you see this happen over and over again, right? You have like Revenge of Ravens. There, there can be three cards in the pack, and Revenge of Ravens will be one of them. I know. Come on. And what that means is because I mean, look, we also said Revenge of Ravens did not uh, did not look that great to us initially, though. Uh, of course, we left ourselves the room of saying, "Hey, these always look better than they uh, you know look or look worse than they are." But uh, I gave it a B minus. Yeah, yeah. Th- I gave I it, it but, first pick quality card. I'm not like going to sit here and listen to you. Yeah, I know. And I was even low on it. But don't act like we said it sucked. Like, we well, gave it a much better no. grade than than that. Yeah. Right. What I, but what I'm saying is if the first pass was like, hey, Revenge of Ravens isn't great, that's what the bots are thinking. The bots yeah. are looking at it like it's yep. a C- minus or a D plus. And what that means is you play against Revenge of Ravens, it feels like every third match. Like – that, that makes- sucks. I mean, the truth is, like, I want my opponent to play that with most of the decks I've been playing because I'm the sure. so tiny charm sleep, but I totally – maybe the bots are just next level. <laughs> They're all drafting yeah. great mill decks or something. Yeah. So- no, but it's true. They, 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 haven't, you know, they haven't done the adjustments yet, I don't think. Yeah. So – Basically, you know, Reeves will remind me of it, but it is it is it is kind of rough going right now, and I hope to see some action there. It, it, look, this isn't something that can't be changed. It clearly can be, but right now there are some obvious glaring holes that have made the experience less fun than I would like. I can think of one way to fix it. Yeah? Yeah, just humans. Well, yes. <laughs> I think we would both love that. But yeah. uh for 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 the time being, I have I have found it to be more satisfying to draft on Magic Online. Yeah, I have to. Also, I tend uh, to just sort of get in a groove with one or the other. You know what I mean? Sure, like, like n- not with the cards, but just like in the flow of it and like, oh, I've got a couple of trophies now or, you know, I'm working my way up the yeah. ladder. Or, you know, just you kind of get into a, a mode somehow with one or the other. <clears throat> For sure. Um, so that was our uh, interruption in between the top two commons. The third was mm-hmm. is one that, uh, you know, has o- consistently overperformed. We just keep we keep telling each other about these situations where it's been awesome. It's a Reaper yeah. of Night. Mm-hmm. That's the, the seven mana four or five, but it's you know critically harvest fear three and a black sorcery adventure. Your opponent discards two cards. In a in a format based around card advantage and late game, this is a really really good way to go about it because mm-hmm. you can two for one them early or mid game rather, and then later just cast a four or five. Which yeah, that's gonna get some work done. It's gonna eventually block. I I, I really love you know run away together plus this com- This is a nice little combo. There's just a lot going on here, and I think Reaper of Night is a pretty clear third best black. Card. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, we we had speculated about if the format was slow, but now we're sitting here talking about bouncing it <laughs> to reap. Like that means that we've put 11 mana into the thing and then we're going to put two more, then four more, then another seven. <laughs> and we're like, yeah, that's sweet. That's a good game plan. Like, hmm, little snapshot on the format right there, right? It's not like there's a bunch of, you know, small red and white creatures that are running over this format if, if we're talking about that on the show. Yeah, because uh, it looks, it looked like it, you know, maybe a fringe playable straight up, and just given how slow the format is, all of a sudden it's just a, a very strong one. Uh, another one that I, I think that the first two, right, the, the premium removal spells would have been the case regardless of the speed or how the format played out. But Reaper of Young, and then the next one is Forever Young. These ones are big indicators on a on a slower format for sure. 
Definitely. And Forever Young is so is so good. This is the sorcery for one in a black, put as many creatures as you want from your graveyard on top of your deck, the draw card. The reason this card is so powerful is that the games go long and your opponent's milling you sometimes. So first of all, it's good against mill because if they mill your good creatures, you can then draw them with this card. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like a tutor. Second, it actually protects you from milling where if they're like kind of milling you with a bunch of, you know, Merfolk secret keepers, you get down to like five or six cards in deck. Then you're like, all right, I'm going to put back nine creatures. Yep. It, it just makes their job a lot harder. So yeah, they get, you, you get the protection from mill and then they're just drawing straight up gasoline every turn. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's a it's a very it's a very powerful card in a bunch of different situations, and you know that's not to, to set aside the fact that you can cycle it on turn two if you need to. You can cast mm-hmm. it with no targets and just yeah. go ahead and, and get get your extra card out of it, which is awesome. I had kind of a sweet play. You would have liked this one. My opponent played Forever Young, and they stacked three or four creatures on top of their library, and I let it happen. Um, because one of the creatures that they, so they put them back and then I was, and they, they were going to play something and I let it go because I actually had, um, didn't say please in hand. And the first card that they stacked, they had a lot of mana, uh, was the, uh, the one, one fairy that draws a card. Yeah. And I'm like, they're going to put that on top and then they're going to try to chain like the next thing into it or whatever. And instead I just didn't say please. And it just milled all the creatures back in the <laughs> yard. It was kind of sweet. Yeah. So that um, was basically like countering for every young, but wasted a bunch more of their mana. But I didn't have the mana to counter it. So, Oh, I see. Yes. Well, in yes. that case, yes. there we go. Yes. Uh, but normally I wouldn't counter the fairy, right? It's like, yeah, sure. Have a fairy. But th- in this case, I got to, uh, you know, get the, get the rest of the stuff as well. Um, What's next on the on the uh, power uh, ranking? Tempting for black? witch, and and we're mm-hmm. gonna you know when we're, well we can have we can post these with the show notes or in the show notes right so yeah, so people yeah. so people can see all them oh because, sure yeah uh, tempting witch is next this is a two and a black for a one three and you make a food and then you can all your food turn into reverse food you can pay <laughs> two and tap tempting witch <laughs> sack of food and your opponent loses to life instead when food goes wrong or in this case somebody throws an apple at your head yeah. And uh, Tempting Witch, kind of like we said last week, has a lot more utility in uh, in slower games than than you might imagine. Mm-hmm. It's just a good win condition. It just is. It it doesn't care about combat. It doesn't care about so tiny. It just basically it's a card you can pick up fairly late and uh, and demands removal at some point. And if you have enough of those, you'll win the game because they can't kill everything you do. And then I have forebod- foreboding fruit as the last one. Of course, we didn't go. We didn't put every single common on it. Was I tried to cut it off at the the notables or whatever? But uh, foreboding fruit's been fine, uh, especially if you can adamant it. Which sometimes you yeah. don't play it on turn three. You wait till a little later, and then sometimes you can. Black has um, uh, has been a good mm-hmm. color. Uh, pairing it with blue yeah. or green is is pretty effective. I've had good black black red decks as well. These are more traditional, quote unquote, good draft decks where it's just like. Uh, I think I actually showed you the first four picks of that draft. That was the draft where I opened Rankle and got past two bacon two pies immediately. <laughs> yes, that was some genius moves. Although, I, if I recall, didn't that one go a little bit uh, sideways for you? Yeah, that I ended up basically being mono black, splashing like five or six red cards. I could have gotten away with uh, yeah. fewer, but once they started playing red, I should just play all of them. Um, mm-hmm. But black red all removal is a, is a deck and. You know, mm-hmm. there there are there are reasons to be that. It's also, Steel Claw Lance is is a card I found to be pretty effective in this format because uh, is that the knight equipment? Yeah, that makes yeah, it, cards really good. When you're talking about removal, well, this makes all your creatures into threats, and it just keeps reequipping. So it's good against removal decks as long as you can keep up a stream of dorks. So mm-hmm. yeah, you can do I, that I, with I have, even some of the slower removal or slower equipment as well. Definitely. And I think that equipment is one way to – it's funny because you think equipment's not good against removal because you invest a lot mm-hmm. in a creature and then they kill it and your equipment's you, – you, all the mana you sunk into your equipment isn't good. But it's good against removal because it does uh, make it so all your creatures are threats. One of the keys that removal decks try to lean on is they ignore your bad creatures and use removal on your good ones. Well, the Steel Claw Lance can make uh, make it so all of your creatures are good. Yeah, that's right. Um, red? Red, yeah, kicking things off with Scorching Dragonfire. I think that that was going to be the case no matter what. One on a red deal three instant to a creature is just you know, is exactly where we want to be. It exiling mm-hmm. is also relevant against black in this format, mm-hmm. which is pretty nice. And then uh, 
after that, Searing Barrage has done has done some good work. It turns out the extra three damage is is real value. Like that really does indeed. make this into more than just a five mana removal spell. Also, this being an instant makes it compare pretty favorably to something you know like Turn to Ash. Yeah, it's it, it's an anti food as well, right? It just it burns up one of their foods. Yeah, exactly. Uh, kind of. Then Merchant of the Veil vale has been a pretty good addition to just about any deck, especially good in the blue red draw two deck. Um, but you know, just a good card. Basically, it helps you. It helps prevent flood. It's just a solid little creature. When my opponent has one of those in play, I'm usually like minorly annoyed, which is the sign of a good card. You know. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And then uh, Brimstone Trebuchet, which is uh, definitely an aggressive card, despite it being a, a defender with reach, because in like red, black or red, white knights, this can do something like, you know, 1.7 damage a turn or 1.5 damage a turn, which is pretty good for an unblockable creature. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and it can it can get a little out of hand, although I haven't really seen a way to make it go completely insane, but still. And then green has been really strong for me as well, uh, pairing up, as you mentioned, with blue or black, particularly um, but uh, I have out muscle as the the best one. You know, I, mean, I, I think fierce witch stalker is better. I, do you? I would okay. rather have I, the witch stalker. Like it's just so mm-hmm. big, and it gives you a food for all of your food synergy. Mm-hmm. It's, it's also got trample. Like why does it have trample? Just well, actually, I'm not complaining. Green needs to have really premium commons. If black can get baked into a buy, green can have trample on the witch stalker. Yeah, I, I think this one's really close. Like, I actually figured that out muscle would get interacted with a lot more than it has in practice. When I've been playing it, I'm like, I've almost always been able to find a spot where it is basically bake into a pie, like it's kill something. Have you never so tiny someone in response to an out muscle? Oh, I totally have. Yeah. The the disappointing part is if it gets, uh, what's it called? If it gets indestructible anyway, and then you don't get to actually like eat their thing, but still. Um, okay, so Fear Switch Stalker, number one, Out Muscle, number two, or maybe Flop, depending yeah. on your opinion on that. Um, and then there's and then we, Rose Thorn. And then, okay. and then we drop off a cliff. <laughs> is what yeah, we, do. <laughs> we really do. Uh, that part gets so much worse. Rose Thorn, Acolyte, Garen Brig, Carver. These are playables. Like, don't, don't get me wrong. The Tuinvel Tree Focus is right after the Carver as well. Um, they're all just sort of interchangeable and not really exciting, right? No, not at all. Like green is just when it's when you have this shallow of a bench at common, it's kind of unfortunate. I, I have I did want to note that Curious Pair has actually been pretty good. I I have found myself playing Curious Pair in all my black green decks, and even in green blue, it can be decent. Uh, just a, a food plus a one three gives you a couple different things you want, and then uh, Garenbrig Paladin again the the four and a green four four adamant that uh, gets plus plus one counter and can't be blocked by creatures with two uh, power or less. The common questing beast, as they call it. Uh, this, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have found Garen Brig Paladin to be solid. Like green, green can actually close close out games with this card nicely. So I agree. Yeah, it, it's not it's not the end of the world. I, I think green is solid. Um, I haven't liked the green aggro decks very much. The Wildwood Tracker decks that just hasn't come together quite as nicely. And, and I've played against it a lot because everyone loves one mana two twos, but. It just feels like you can beat those decks fairly easily. Yeah, I, I think those ones are basically just unplayable. You know, when I think of green, th- the Fear Switch Stalker and the Out Muscle stand out a little bit, and then it's very flat. Um, but I don't think that's a bad thing, right? Like y- you mentioned, you know, we, we just went, what, seven cards deep, and they're all totally playable. Yeah. You know, they're all fine, where that isn't necessarily the case. If you look at white, it falls off really hard after Youthful Night, where you're just like, I don't want to play these cards. Not that just that they're not exciting. I don't even really want them in my deck, where green, it goes actually pretty deep. It's a much more evened out color, um, but, you know, by comparison. Which which I think makes it pretty strong. Like you said, each of those cards all all playable. Yeah, so. I, it, it's totally fine. Also, uh, green is nice with one of my uh, favorite build arounds, which is uh, the Lucky Clover. I, I, mm-hmm. think that, I think that card is quite strong. So I got smashed by that the other day. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely coming around on it, especially uh, if you get it early, so you know to yeah. just go ahead and take all the adventure stuff anyway. Harvest Fear with that card is just so insane. It's just mindless. <laughs> that is so mean. Like, seriously, not cool. It's also not that hard. I mean, obviously, it's not going to happen too often. But if you're in the mm-hmm. Black Green deck, if you open Lucky Clover into turn three Rose Thorn Acolyte, it lets you accelerate you because you pay one green mana and you get two mana of any color. And then you can harvest mm. through them for four cards on turn three. Oh, that's gross. 
Wow. Yeah, that's really, really gross. Yeah, it's pretty huh. sweet. I never, I haven't seen that. Uh, yeah, that's disgusting. I saw a clip of okay. Ben doing it mm-hmm. on a stream, and uh, MJ was talking about it too. So it's it's a thing that can happen. I haven't. Oh, it's just a thing everybody's that. doing now, huh? All Everybody cool just has the lucky clovers. I guess yeah. it is an extremely. MJ definitely lucky has clover. a lucky clover. He he twelve would to in, to qualify for the mocks last week. So twelve oh. Yep, he did. Wow, good you know, for him. Not, that's nine impressive. Nine would with his you know kind of crappy black green sealed deck, and then uh, three would the draft. Wow, good for him. That's absurd. That, that's a quite an accomplishment. Um, let's talk about the format because uh, yeah. you know it's been evolving. We've going and so, we, and we've talked a little bit on, on this intro mm-hmm. here or as we've gone through the top commons. Even like I said, looking at the top yeah. commons of each color informs where we're at with the format. The, mm-hmm. This format, it, 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 I guess, a little bit reminds me of too much of a good thing is not a good thing. Like, look, we mm. can we can we can make as many jokes as we want about how we like slow formats and drawing cards and all this stuff. But this format seems like it's too much of it. Like it does a little bit, doesn't it's, it? It's to the point where I don't feel like I'm really getting, like, I don't feel great about it, you know? So mm-hmm. yeah. there's a lot of cool stuff going on, but I'm worried that aggro once again, does not have enough of a presence. Cause it just, I, I like when it keeps people honest. Including it, there should be one good aggro deck at least. Right. So you don't want every color pair to be, aggro uh necessarily i mean some people do but you know i I like a balance but when there's none right when there's no respectable aggro deck it does create an issue or at least if nobody's playing it i yeah i don't agree that there's no playable aggro decks i do think that there that such a thing exists i just think that they're less powerful than the non-aggro decks it's not look it's not m13 bad right the the one where opportunity was the best card in the format but, it's M14, yeah. M14, but I, I do mm-hmm. wish that uh I do wish that aggro was like a little bit stronger. Yeah, that format was sweet though. <laughs> the, the best common was divination and the best uncommon was opportunity. <laughs> yeah. I mean maybe, that, that, maybe that, perhaps about, too though, much like, of a good thing there that, too. Though. That's just not that's just not where I, I think it's good to be. Like I don't think I, that I that's don't either. I don't think that that's that leads to a healthy draft format. And I I like I like there being a lot of decisions. I mean, I guess this. Well, we'll, we'll get to it. So, what what have you been drafting? I think it can be. It's kind of clear based on uh, some of what you're saying here. Yeah, I've been drafting a lot of base blue with a lot of so tinies, uh, and you know, I keep drafting these like, like the, the other day I was on Magic Online and I drafted a sweet control deck, right? And I'm like, all right, I, I've got all my removal, I've got my tricks, I'm gonna I'm gonna smash these green white red white opponents, these beat down instead. And by the way, this is a story that I could repeat. I faced down a blue-black control mirror that went forever, uh, that we were both decking each other. Then I faced green-black long game food. In other words, like an engine kind of deck uh, based on food. It wasn't, you know, trying to kill me quickly. And then the blue-red deck, the Draxter cards deck. And I'm just like, wow. Like this and every single one of them felt like a rough matchup. Like it wasn't um, unwinnable or anything like that. But the games were going to go long. We were going to exhaust each other's resources. There was no situation where I was thinking like, oh, I just have a huge edge here, you know, by by the way that I've built my deck. Because the way that I built it was to beat green, white or red, white or whatever. And then I had a good, solid enough plan against other types of decks. And it turns out I didn't need to lean my deck in the direction. I should have just been leaning in the other way and saying, well, I'll maybe keep some cards in the sideboard that I can bring in if my opponent is trying to beat me down. But otherwise, I want the inevitability. I want the long game. I want the counter spells. I want that kind of stuff. And dude, these games are taking forever. Like I had multiple matches, like at least two just in the last few days where the clocks ended up being a very real issue, you know, where both players were playing me and the the other player. And I'm looking at my clock like, hey, this might this might matter. I'm going to be way on top of this at like the eight minute mark. Because I have eight minutes and my opponent has six. And I'm thinking, yeah, that, that might be the way that this ends. you know. And in one case, that is how it ended. Um, and I got to tell you, man, that makes me a little nervous for the long-term implications of a format if everybody ends up pushing in that direction. Because to me, there's like two different types of long game, drawn out game type formats um, there's one of them where things are interesting because you don't really know who's going to win. Like it's like I could top deck something great and pull ahead. And I've had a bunch of games like that and those are great. 
But the other kind is kind of when one player is ahead on a metric, but it doesn't actually win the game until later. Like, for example, milling, right? I've, I've fired off two secret keepers and, and, I mean, uh, and I didn't say please on you, but now we're just at a full on stalemate. And it's just like, well, I'm just going to be over here answering everything until you're dead from, from decking. And it takes forever. Makes me nervous. I mean, what's even worse and has happened is you're playing like the black green mirror and you're just like, oh, I've got 13 cards left in my deck and you've got 12. All right. I guess, I guess this is what we're going to do. And then you hope that mm-hmm. they don't have a forever young to like throw off the balance or, or, or you know, a foreboding fruit or whatever. And yep. these are the kind of games. And this is kind of the, the discussion that we saw on Twitter about uh, concessions, which is I think most people, it's not the length of the game. It's like you said, it's whether it's the game is in question or not. So mm-hmm. yes, you can always concede, right? You, 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 that's always mm-hmm. an option, but it's not fun to concede a game that you think you might win. And if, so, and if you have like a 15% chance to win, most people are just not going to want to concede that game because yeah, 15% is not 0%. It's not 1%. Like mm-hmm. I know, I know plenty of people who would be like, well, I'd rather concede a 1% game than play for another 15 minutes. But most mm-hmm. people, are you going to concede a 15, 20% game? What about a 10% no. game? And no. it's not fun to play those games though. It's not fun to play from a losing position. Like you don't want to, like most people do not find it enjoyable to be like, well, I am losing this game, but I'm going to stay in because if they draw four land in a row, maybe I can stage a comeback. Yeah. And yeah. And you know, it comes down to what you, what you value, right? It, I mean, if, if you're, if you're all about the win or if you value your time heavily, or if you value enjoyment or, you know, you have to kind of balance out where you stand on it before you can make a decision like that. Yeah, it, it is, but but what I, but I think what the the, the dangerous part about Eldraine, at least in some cases here, is that most like most people have different you know a lot a lot of people have different like you said ways on on what they value or with different calculus, and some people will concede a, a what they think is a five percenter, and some people will not concede a one percenter. But almost mm-hmm. nobody's conceding a twenty percenter, and there's just a lot of games mm-hmm. that you're like fifteen to twenty percent to win, but are, it's going to take you like another you know ten turns to discover that. And, yeah. And that's right. It, it, it is. I, I just worry that it, I mean, there's also just a practical side of this too, which is like, let's say I'm, I'm super busy. I get home from work. I've got a kid. I've, I've, I'm doing school. I'm, you know, I've just got a busy life or something. And I come home and I'm like, Hey, I want to get a draft in. If it ends up being, you know, one match takes 45 minutes rather than the average 15 or 20 or whatever it normally takes. It's like, Hmm. You know, I, I wonder if you're really going to sit down and do that. Uh, if if you can, if you have to buckle in for this huge grind fest, and they're also kind of overwhelming mentally. They're just they can be, you know, very. There can be so many permanents on the battlefield, and you have to be thinking about all the cards uh, in your deck that you haven't drawn yet, and what your opponent can have in the set. And you know, while people like you and I tend to kind of uh, thrive and really enjoy those type of scenarios, you know, gosh, I. I do wonder if you're just uh, a little more casual and you're like, hey, you know, I'm going to jump on arena and play. And all of a sudden you've got 15 creatures and they do too. And you've got eight cards left in your library and you have to like try to understand what's happening. It just, it can be a bit much, um, you know, it, it, if there isn't sort of a, a little bit more of a scaled down version available. Um, I, I mean, I, maybe we're overthinking, like well, maybe it's not going to happen like that every single time. And the ones when it does just stand out, but it does. Yeah. Make me a little nervous. I, I do think that I, I'm not quite as uh, – I, I don't think it's quite as foregone of a conclusion as, as you do in terms of how much control versus aggro there is in the format. Okay. Because mm-hmm. I, I, I found that the monocolor decks actually do a pretty decent job of of presenting a, a fast clock. Mm, okay. But I do think it – look, don't get me wrong. I think it's slanted towards these controlling slow decks. But I don't think it's it's – the impossible to draft aggro or no aggro exists. I think that aggro certainly okay. does exist. So, okay. Uh, but yeah, ha- the, this is always the danger of mill specifically. I think mill is the real culprit here that, well, and Revenge mm-hmm. of the Ravens, that's just a, an individual card I have an issue with. But mill, mm-hmm. mill does lead itself to games where it takes quite a while to finish, but it doesn't feel very close. And that's, that's one of the things that I think really stands out in this format is that, yeah, they did it. Mill's a good, mill's a good deck in this format. Regardless of whether yeah. you think aggro's, you know, decent, good, terrible, whatever, it's hard to deny that mill is viable. And we think mm-hmm. it's even a step greater than that. We think it's good. 
Yeah. I think blue is really kind of just about that. You know, that's kind of the main, the main thing, whether it's your main wind condition with a bunch of, uh, mer merfolk secret keepers, uh, or maybe one of the big ones like a folio or something. Um, or if it's more like a sub theme where like, you know, I had a deck that had midnight clock. And that was my, my mill win condition, if you will. And, you know, because it basically, it just says like, if I can just make this game go until the midnight clock goes off, then you're going to get milled before I do, <clears throat> because I'm going to shuffle in everything. And, and of course, get a bunch of value in the process as well to propel me into that last stage of the game. Yeah. Um, um it's actually kind but of sitting funny... there knowing you're going to get milled is pretty rough. Yes. That part <clears throat> is, is rough regardless. And one thing that's a kind of funny side effect, by the way, is, I was pretty high on the blue red deck initially, but I'm a little mm -hmm. less high now that your opponents are also trying to mill you. When you're trying to essentially <laughs> mill yourself and they're trying to mill you, it can actually get pretty uh, tough. It's funny because that does actually come up uh, fairly often. I've had that happen to me where I actually got the dream set up and just lost because you're I didn't like, have enough fuel. I've got this, you know, unlikely alliance, and I'm, you know, I can make a two one ones a turn. But it's like, well, no, I can only make like three more of these before I run out of cards because they're also trying to reduce my deck size. So mm -hmm, totally, that, that, yeah, that cuts I, I into boarded the, into a fifty-one card deck. Yeah, that, that, I did. I, in fact, this is a video that'll be up on CFB. I, I was just like, I, my opponent's playing basically sort of the the blue deck that you would expect, where it has some secret keepers, but it's not like turbo mill. It's not like mill, 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 mill. You're dead. It's more just like get ahead on library. Right. You know, library damage, if you will, you know, where, you know, you've got fewer cards or they've got fewer cards than you do and then sort of maintain that pace. And I just felt like I had all the tools to win the game, except for that they would get ahead of me on milling and and I would end up losing or they could simply mill away. I think that was the midnight clock deck. Maybe I forget. But, you know, they would mill away a key piece. And by the way, this set has never made me more nervous about what they're going to mill. Cause normally a lot of things are interchangeable, right? It's like, Oh, I have 16 creatures. If they mill my better creature, well, I'll, I'll get my fourth best creature instead, whatever. Right. It doesn't really matter, but here it does. Like if they milled my midnight clock and that was kind of my game plan, it's done it. If I merfolk secret keeper them and I see forever young go to the yard, I'm like, booyah, you know, we got yeah, totally. it. Like, cause there's so few cards that actually matter when you get to the point of neither playing being neither player being interested in attacking All right. so, uh, particularly. So I have an assignment for us this next week, Ben. Okay. Let's try to make aggro work. Try to, whether it's monocolor, whether it's white based, okay. whether it's red black, because look, we, we, we naturally started, like, I think the mill decks and the control decks are good. You know, black green food mm -hmm. is very good. Blue black is good. Uh, we definitely investigated blue red, but I think it's worth trying to see how good aggro is as well, because I think there is something there. There, there are real aggressive cards. Okay. Ardenvale Tactician is a very real card. Uh, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, if you're mono blue, four mana, three, three flyer is good. If you're mono black, four mana, four, three menace is good. The, the, these mm -hmm. are reasons to, to try to attack the opponent. And I think that there, there is a way to fight, fight these decks. It just so happens it is effective to draft these mill and control decks. So that's what we're going to do a lot of the time. But I, I think that we need to do our due diligence and, and not, you know, come to the conclusion, oh, this is a mill format. Everything's slow. Because, yes. Love this idea. That's part Love of it. it. But, well, you know, I believe we can find other ways as well. Okay. So where, where would you start? Like, obviously, we don't get to choose this. But if you had the, the choice, would you start with the monocolor decks or would you start with like a, a knight color pair or something like that? I think the monocolor decks are, are stronger. But I think knights, are, knights has potential as well. If you can, Where would you look on monocolor? Monocolor, I, I like the idea of like mono blue and mono black, like more aggressive. Okay. Focus decks. Okay. And I think mm -hmm. mono green actually can be there. A lot of the, the monocolor decks depend on how many hybrids you have too. Because yeah, if you can get two or those three of the, the different hybrids, that can yeah. work out nicely. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, those can really get the job done. Yeah. and Okay. And then what were you saying about the knights decks? If the knights decks can pressure the opponent, the fact that half the knights are combat tricks means that you can curve out and have all the combat tricks you need at the same time. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and I, wonder, I wonder if we can just go all in. Yeah. And I think that that, that's potential, uh, that has potential as well. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I'm definitely, I, I will take your challenge and I hope our listeners will as well and try to come up with at least what does the good aggro deck look like? Yeah. Of course you can draft a good aggro deck, right? I mean, your seat is what's going to determine that if you're the only player in your area of the table, who's drafting red and white. Well, I got good news for you. You're going to have a sweet deck, right? And it's just a matter of, uh, understanding how what an actual 
good aggro deck looks like. Is it all combat tricks? Is it, you know, one of the decks that put a ton of pressure on me used the, uh, what is it called? The Rimrock guy? The, yeah, Rim, the one the, that's Rim, a, Rimrock Knight, the red for a plus two plus oh, and then it's a two mana three one. Yeah, and he was, they were just slamming on me with it where I was like, um, they were, you know, because it only adds to the power, right? Yeah. So it's not like something, you know, that is that great, but the plus two plus O ends up adding up. And then a three one that can't block for only two mana is like, hey, uh, it, it's going to start hitting you pretty hard. And if you turn all of those into shocks, <laughs> I'm you know, not gonna it's a lie. thing. I didn't realize mm-hmm. Rimrock Knight can't block because I've only just been attacked by it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah sure, yeah. sure can't <laughs> what, what if the what if the text just said you shouldn't block with rimrock <laughs> yeah that'd be awesome R- raging red cap also seems pretty good this is the one two double yes. striker in these decks mm-hmm. so yeah like you, exactly like you could you could uh use it's called boulder rush on rimrock yeah. knight you know get in for a bunch and then cast the knight because it's cheap because it's only three mana total so you can do this uh you know a little bit off curve and and get it done uh, and I do wonder if just piling on that extra damage does it. Because to me, the reason why we see this hostility and the thing that we're trying to combat here is twofold. One, the removal is just excellent in this format, yeah. right? Blue has premium removal. Black has premium removal. And red has pretty darn good removal. And so that's going to make it really tough for the aggro decks. And then the other one is food, right? It's just the numbers are different here. Right, like what? What is the average starting life total of a deck or of a, of a player in Throne of Eldraine versus War of the Spark? War of the Spark, it's twenty, and then any life gain that you get would would change. Obviously, not starting life total, but you know what I mean. How much damage do you have to do to kill a, an opponent on average in an average format? Right, it's probably like twenty one or something. Right, like because there's maybe a few life gain spells that throw that slightly off. Here, it feels like it's like 24 or 25 or something insane yeah, where it's it, like everyone just way higher. Mm-hmm. And so that's the question that I have is like, do we attack that by being more all in and making food too slow, right? If they have to sacrifice food to stay alive and they can't develop their board, you're in good shape. That That's a good place to be. And, uh, you know, maybe – uh, Boulder Rush Rimrock Knight is the way to do that. But if they're going to start at 26, I don't want to be, you know, casting spells that only do two damage or whatever to my opponent's face. So those are some of the questions that my brain starts to hit up, at least in, in the early stages here. Uh, yeah. About how to make these aggro decks work. For sure. And, and I think that it's, 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 it's a challenge that it's worth, worth undertaking because our initial impression of the format, well, we were pretty well defined here, but what, what, where it goes from here is, uh, I, don't know, I think it's interesting to, to to kind of play it out a little bit, especially since we've got plenty of more time here to yeah. to, to justify that. I know we're in like week one. <laughs> we're really, we're in, like, we're really, it, really in like week three. Like, is know, it week three? It's week two, right? It's like two and a half or something like that, right? Okay. Yeah, I know you're right. Wait. Yeah, you're right. Two and a half. Something like okay. that. Okay. So we're we're actually, and I'm, I've drafted it a ton of times now, so it, it feels like we're definitely getting a feel for it. Okay, any other stuff we wanted to hit before we uh, call this one a show, Luis? No, I mean, I think that, it, you know, the, 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 some good takeaways here, it, looking at the top commons of each color definitely is, is, is very useful. And then trying to figure out, like, what, what do these commons imply about what these decks are trying to do, or at least what we think these decks mm-hmm. are trying to do, also mm-hmm. uh, can kind of inform where, where you want to be when it comes to this format. And, yeah, I mean, we're going to try, we're going to, we're going to report back next week on what aggro, the, the landscape of aggro in, in, in Eldraine. But initially, it's the Soltai colors once again seem like the strongest. So. Yeah. Once again, welcome back. This has been the trend. We'll see if and, we can, and, and if look, just you I'll and I can change again, it. Because this always comes up. This isn't just we like doing this stuff. Like I am testing for a mythic championship. It's, I think, pretty mm-hmm. well documented that I'll, I'll draft aggro decks if those are what's best. And, you yes. know. I think that uh, Sultai, my initial impression, seems like the best place to be, some combination of those things. But there's there's plenty left to explore here. Yeah, and we will be doing so. And we'll report back with our findings next week uh, and let you know. And, of course, if you uh, find out anything that seems to be working consistently, let us know. You can find us on social media, Marshall underscore LR and LSV. Uh, anywhere, you know, Twitter is a good place for it, but, uh, I've got an Instagram. I've got, we've got a Facebook thing. We've got all the stuff. So whatever it is, 
uh, that you find, let us know. Uh, you know, and and look, if you send us a screenshot of the one awesome aggro deck that has six uncommons and two rares or whatever, it'd be like, okay, you know, that that counts. But what I want to see is some consistency here, right? I want to see like, hey, yeah, if those I, colors are remotely open, I can draft that deck. I would love to know? see the like good red white aggro deck that has, yeah, maybe it has a rare and a couple uncommons, sure, but I don't want to see a deck, mm-hmm. you know, that, like what Pat Cox sent me the other night, which was. Uh, so he had like circle of loyalty, uh, you know, two of the red, white hybrid red knights. Like he just had like four rares in his deck, opportunistic dragon. Like <laughs> I, I was Come like, on, Pat Cox. I was like, yeah, okay. Like, look, I, I get it. You're, you're able to take the cards that show up in the top left, but <laughs> that's not that's not a that's not exactly what we're asking for. Did he tee all the dubs? No, he went two one actually. So oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, let us know. And and also, if you have had success uh, with it, let us know there as well. Um, of course, this uh, show is brought to you by ChannelFireball.com. I'm, I'm just going to hammer it again because it's, it's a big deal. 40% on your trade-ins, uh, you know, on ChannelFireball.com slash buy list. You're just not going to find a better deal than that. And uh, again, if you've got that that pile of rare sitting there that's just not doing anything for you, now's a good time. Now now's a good time to go ahead and hop on there and see what you can get for them, and maybe get yourself a, a box of of Throne of Eldraine or some of these fancy cards or whatever. Uh, because yeah, forty percent is going to do very well for you. That's going to do it for the show this week. Thanks once again for coming along with us. We always appreciate you oh, taking yeah. the time, and we'll see you next week. <laughs> so. Uh... I've been playing a ton of Magic recently, and it's actually really funny because I how much I play does like kind of wax and wane depending on what's going on, and I'm like well above my normal peak by like a lot. And it's not mm-hmm. just testing for any particular event. I mean, you've you've seen the the group chat with me you and, and Chion, right, where I'm just like talking about modern and like sending you vintage lists and stuff like that. And I don't know what it is, but I'm just obsessed with paradoxical outcome and. I actually think that I've stumbled upon a very, very good modern deck. I mean, look, it's not a secret. The the outcome deck was a deck in modern even before uh, Thorn of Eldraine. But I think Thorn of Eldraine really kicked into overdrive. And I'm going to just indulge myself and talk about this deck because I love it so much. Uh, Ooh, sweet. So this is the deck that's using Urza as kind of the best card. It's the most important card, even though most people call it outcome. Urza outcome is the second most – is often what it's called, actually. So this is a two blue blue for a one four. Enters the battlefield, you make a, a construct that's as big. It's an artifact that's as big as your total number of artifacts, right? It's plus plus one for each mm-hmm. artifact you control. But it mm-hmm. also has the Urza also has the ability to tap an untapped artifact you control at a blue mana to your mana pool. And what that does is it makes it so all your artifacts are mock sapphires, and it gets around stony silence or collector oath. So if you have Urza in play, it's mm. like you have near infinite mana because the rest of the deck is all zero and one mana artifacts plus a couple key blue cards. So we're talking Mox Opals, Mox Ambers, Everflowing Chalice, Engineered Explosives, uh, Mishra's Bobble, Witching Well, which is another new addition, which is very good because a blue for a scry two. And then later when you have tons of mana, you can sack it to draw two. Very good. And then and it taps for mana. Yep. And then it taps for mana. And then you've got uh, four copies of Paradoxical Outcome. That's three and a blue. Instant return any number of non-land, non-land non-token permanents uh, to your hand. And draw a card for each. So if you have Urza and Outcome, all your artifacts tap for mana. They all get bounced. You draw that tons and tons of cards. Then you have, you know, nearly twice as many artifacts that all tap for mana. And you can chain Outcomes, draw your whole deck. You also have uh, Sai uh, and Sahili, both of which are three mana, you know, legends that whenever you play an artifact, you make a 1-1. Mm-hmm. And then uh, four copies of Emery, because she often comes out for one mana and then can tap to replay all your zero mana artifacts. So she's like a one mana, one, two. It makes your Mox Ambers tap for mana. And man, this deck seems so good. Wow, it, this is awesome. It's just like it's like a turn three deck that also is really resilient in a late game because if they don't kill Emery, she you know she can rebuy Bobbles every turn and draw you a card. Oh, it's also got four Arkham's Astrolabe, which I think think low key is just the, one of the best cards in modern. Um, mm-hmm. And it's got a bunch. It's got eight boxes. Uh, it also gets to grind them out because Urza also has another ability just in case it needed more, which is. You can pay five mana, shuffle your deck, and then play the top card for free. So it basically means if you just have Urza and a bunch of artifacts that do nothing, you can still ca- activate this ability multiple times a turn and pull ahead of your opponent because you'll eventually find something. So I found this deck to be really fun to play, really fast, and really good at grinding, which just makes it a great deck. I wouldn't be surprised if 
it's slightly at risk. I think Mox Opal has been living on borrowed time for what feels like years now. So mm-hmm. uh, I don't know. I've just been having a ton of fun with this deck. I think the outcome deck is also good and vintage. But I think for, if for those who play modern, I've loved this deck. I, I, I like it so much that I'm just getting a paper copy of it, which I never do. I mean, you know, everyone thinks pros own a million cards. The, the opposite is actually true. <laughs> yeah. But before a tournament, you try to get a, you scrounge the cards you need. But in this case, I think I'm just going to order all the cards just so I can have the deck and play it at like local modern tournaments. It's, it's just wild because look, I play, that's awesome. I play a lot of Magic, but man, I've been playing a lot of Magic recently, and uh, <laughs> I don't know. I I like talking about what the things that are going on, the things I'm passionate about. It turns out, you know, as some as someone who used to not love modern all that much, I just can't get enough of it. So I would highly recommend that's playing it there. All right, we'll, we'll we'll get a list from you and put it in something in Patreon or the notes or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And I actually think Oko fits in this deck pretty nicely as well. Oh, no. <laughs> in case you needed a little bit more uh, action there. Yeah, more Oko in your life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Was that for your sign-off? Mm-hmm. The cheering fans. Yeah, I mean, if you ever did a sign-off, you'd have your cheering fans, too. <laughs> Man, it's such a shame that in order to get the cleanest, crispest audio quality, I have to start the call and be in control of the soundboard. But, yeah, no, I know. You're really disappointed. <laughs> but I will live with it. I, I have been pretty disciplined, to be honest. Like, Yeah, you have. You, to be fair, you have. 